We now want to prove Tut's theorem. For that, we first have to prove a series of properties of Tut drawings. So let's assume we are given some Tut drawing and we look at a single vertex that is free, so it's not on the outer face. Now we want to place some line through this vertex. The first property says, if there is a neighbor of V on one side of the line, then there is also one on the other side. This is quite easy to see. If all the neighbors of V lie either on the line or on the side here, then if we look at the forces, all the neighbors here would pull V away from the line. And there's nothing on the other side that pulls it back. And since we're at an equilibrium, there have to be forces that equal out. So this cannot be. The second property is all three vertices lie inside the cycle C, so inside the strictly convex polygon that we map the cycle to. Let's try to prove this. So assume we have our polygon here and there is some vertex on the outside. Let's say this one here. We want to make use of property 1. So we choose some line through this vertex that doesn't go through this polygon. We can always find such a line. That's basic computational geometry. Basically, a short argument is look at this edge and take the line through it. If I move the line slightly away, then the polygon is not inside anymore. And then we can move it until we hit that vertex here. If we cannot hit it, we continue with the next edge. And for one of those edges, we must hit the vertex here because we cover the whole area that lies outside of the polygon. Now what about the neighbors of this vertex? We will assume that there is at least one neighbor that's not on the green line. Then by property 1, if there is one neighbor on one side, we also must have one on the other. So there must be some vertex on the other side of this line here that is a neighbor to the red one. Now let's move this line over here. So we take the parallel line through this vertex. It is red as a neighbor, so there has to be a neighbor on the other side. And then we keep moving this line here. It again, by property 1, must have a neighbor on the other side. And so on. So for every vertex here, we must have a neighbor on the other side. And that goes infinitely. But at some point it has to stop, because we only have n vertices. So at some point we have looked at every other vertex. We monotonely moved into that direction. So at some point we cannot find a neighbor anymore. What remains is if all the neighbors of the red vertex lie on this line. That's something we have not covered here. But there is a path from the red vertex to each of these orange ones. And if we look at this path, it can move along this line, but at some point there must be a vertex on this line that has a neighbor on this side. Otherwise we cannot get to the orange vertex. And then instead of starting with the red one, we just start with that one. Property 3. We, we stay with our lines. So now we don't have a fixed vertex, but we just have any line, whatever you want. We want to look at all the vertices that lie on one side of this line, let's say below here. Then if we look at the subgraph of our input graph that's induced by these vertices. So we have these vertices and we have only the edges between them, but we throw out everything else. Then this graph is connected. So this part on this side is connected and this part on the other side is also connected. This is a pretty strong property. So let's try to prove this. We will have a look at this line and we take the orthogonal direction of it. If I move this line until I hit the last vertex, so I basically move along the orthogonal of it, I will end up at some fixed vertex. That is because all the free vertices lie inside, so the extreme vertex must always be a fixed one. Let's say that V is this here. Now we want to prove. If we pick any other vertex here, then there is some path to V. If for every vertex there is a path to V, then there is also a path between every pair of vertices. Because we can just say, okay, if I want to go from here to you, 
I take the path to V and then I take the path to U and then maybe I delete shortcuts so that I get a simple path again, but all is good. So how can we prove that we have a path from U to V? And this uses a very similar argument to what we had here. So we take the line that's parallel to L, we basically move it until we go to U. Now there are two cases. The first one is that V lies on this line. How can this be? This can be because U is V itself, or because it is a neighbor on the outer face. In both cases, we're done. So we assume that V does not lie on this line. But we know that the input graph is connected. In fact, it's even three connected. So we know that in the input graph, there is some path from U to V. Now, we want to use a very similar argument to what we had here. U either has a neighbor on both sides by property one, or all its neighbors lie on this line. If all its neighbors lie on this line, then we just move from U to one of those neighbors. And then for that again, it holds, it has to have a neighbor on both sides, or so all of them lie on this line. If all of them are on this line, we again go to one of its neighbors. And we keep going until at some point we must find some vertex that has a neighbor on both sides. Because there is some path from U to V. So if I just keep walking on the, along this line, at some point I must end up here, just going through neighbors. So we must have some vertex that doesn't have all its neighbors on the line. And that means for property one, it must have one on both sides. So in particular, it must have a neighbor on this side here. And then we take that neighbor and we move the line further. And that way we get a path. We follow these edges along the line until we get this vertex W. It has a neighbor here. And now if I repeat the argument by just moving this line through this vertex, I can find the next edge, find the next edge, and I can find the next edge. And this continues until we get to the extreme vertex, which is V. From here we cannot continue, there is no vertex on this side, but also this is a fixed vertex, so it is fine. So no matter which vertex we have on this side of the line L, we can always find a path here to vertex V, so the whole thing is connected. And this is probably the most important property that we need. There is one more. And that property, if we had it before, it would have made all these proofs so much easier, but we couldn't prove it before. The property 4 says no vertex is collinear with all of its neighbors. So that means we cannot even have these situations that we had to be so careful about uh, how to solve them that all the neighbors of you lie on this line. This cannot even happen. And if we have this, then this makes this proof even easier. So let's assume that there is some vertex that is collinear with all of its neighbors. We want to have a look at all the vertices on this line that are reachable from our vertex by just moving along this line. So these are not only the neighbors, but only transitive. It could be that this is a longer path here. So this forms a connected component on this line. Now, we know, since the outer face is a strictly convex polygon, that not all vertices are collinear. So that means that at least one of these, since the graph is connected, must have a neighbor that is not on this line. Let's say it is here. By property one, that means it must also have a neighbor on the other side. Now, if we apply property three, that means that all the vertices that lie above here and all the vertices lie below here form connected components. So everything here is connected, everything here is connected. Now we can use even stronger that the graph is reconnected. We found one path from the green vertex via this one to all the vertices here and also one path from green via this one to all the vertices here. But there must be at least three vertex disjoint ones 
from green to any blue vertex and from green to every orange. So there must be another one here. For example, by this, we go to the blue. And then by property one, it also connects down here. And there must be another path to the blue here. And by property one, it also connects down here. So there must be at least three red vertices on the screen line that connect to both sides. And now we can construct a K33 minor. And to do that, we contract the blue part, we contract the orange part, and we contract all these here that are not red. That gives us this graph. We have the blue, it is connected to all three red ones. We have the green part, it's connected to all three red ones. And we have the orange part that's connected to all three red ones. So this is a K33 as a minor. And we know from Kuratowski's theorem that the K33 is not planar. And in fact, if you have a K33 minor, then you are not planar. So this is a contradiction. Now we're almost ready to prove that Tut's theorem. We need just one more lemma. For that, we pick any edge that is not an orange boundary edge. Both vertices can be free, or one is free, one is fixed, it doesn't matter. In the proof, I will assume that both are free, but you can still do it if uh, one of them is fixed. You just need a few more technicalities. We take the line that goes through this edge. Then we have two faces in the unique planar embedding. And these faces lie completely on opposite sides. And with completely, I mean that every vertex except U and V lies on the same side. So all the vertices of the blue face except U and V lie on the same side of L. And all the vertices of the red side except U and V lie on the other side of L. This is a really strong lemma. And the proof almost immediately follows from that. So let's try to prove it. We will pick a blue vertex and we will pick a red vertex. And for sake of contradiction, we will assume that both lie on the same side. Now we can use our properties. So we have any line, that's what we need for property three, and that tells us all the vertices on this side are connected. So there is some path from the blue to the red vertex. And now we know from property four, not all its neighbors lie on the line. So there must be one that lies not on the line. And then by property one, that means we must have a neighbor on both sides. So there must be a neighbor up here. And the same one for this vertex. Now again, for property three, everything that lies on this side is connected. So there is a path here. Now we have this purple path between the two brown vertices here. And we have this gray path between the red and the blue vertex. So. We know the graph is planar, so we assume that we have some planar drawing. It doesn't have to be a touch drawing, but just some planar drawing. Let's take, for example, this one here. Where can these paths be in the drawing? We want to have a path from the blue to the red. This path cannot go through the brown vertices, because the brown vertices here lie on this line. That means they cannot be below the line. So we need some path from blue to red that doesn't go through here. So it goes, for example, like this, it can go like this, but it cannot go through these two faces. Now, where can this purple path be? We need a path from this brown one to this brown one. Again, this purple path cannot be the brown edge. It has to involve some other vertices. So we have to route it somewhere around here. At some point, we have to go around these faces to get the, to this brown vertex. Now, what does this mean? If I want to go from here to here and from here to here, we cannot do that without these two paths crossing each other. That means that since the drawing is planar, we cannot have an edge crossing, so there must be some vertex that's both on the gray path 
and on the purple path. But all the vertices on the purple path lie above the line, all the vertices on the gray path lie below the line. And that's of course not possible, so we have a contradiction. So that means that these two vertices cannot lie on the same side of L. We still have to show that they cannot lie on the line. But that's quite simple. So assume that the blue vertex lies here on the line. Then by property 4 and 1 it must have some neighbor below. And now again we have a gray path from the blue vertex to the red one that's completely below the line. And we can repeat the argument. And with that lemma we immediately get that all the faces are strictly convex. So if we look at a single edge and we take the line through this edge, then we have one face above, one below. Let's just look at the blue face below. All the vertices must lie in this blue area. And now we take the next edge. The vertex has to be somewhere here. So let's take the line through that. Now all the remaining vertices must be in this area. Take the next edge. It must be somewhere here. Take the line through it. The remaining vertices must be in this area. And so on. And we can continue until we get back to the first vertex. And at no point there is any possibility that we can make an angle that's larger than 180 degrees. So that's the first property we wanted to show. All the faces we get are strictly convex. And the final thing we need is that our drawing is planar. So let's assume that we have some edge crossing in the touch drawing. Then there must be some point that is close to these two edges that lies in two faces, namely the face that is above the blue edge and the face that is above the red edge. So, we have our convex polygon on the outside for the outer face. We want to pick some point that is outside here. From property 2, we know all three vertices lie inside here. So there cannot be any vertex outside of the orange polygon, so Q lies in exactly one face. Now we add the line through Q and P. If we move along this line, there can be some edges that it crosses. But for every edge that we cross, we can apply this lemma. If I jump from here to here, I go over this edge. And this edge has one face on this side and one face on the other side. So I jump from one face to again exactly one. I cannot enter another face, I cannot leave a face without jumping over an edge. But whenever we jump over an edge, the number of faces stays the same, because we leave one and we enter one. So as long as we move along this line, jump over all these faces, at some point we reach P, we are still in exactly one face. And that's a contradiction to the assumption that P lies in two faces. So that's a contradiction to the assumption that we have a crossing. And that means that we have proven that the TUT drawing is indeed planar. That's it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed the proof and thank you for watching.